And um, this morning, uh, we're looking at something in, in Baptist history in the continent of Europe, and it's, it's hard to, to, or maybe impossible, to chronologically trace the, the, Bas- the Baptist movement um, across Europe in the last couple hundred years, uh, the beginning of the Baptist movement. Um, Europe, uh, the face of Europe changes or has changed so frequently, and this is kind of hard for us as Americans to, to maybe uh, know because our boundaries don't change very much, but um, because of war, um, employment, business, uh, the, the lines of the countries have changed over the years. They've been pretty uh, settled for a few years, but uh, maybe the last 15 or 20, but they're just constantly changing. And, and so it's kind of hard to track some of this, but um, long before uh, Baptist missionaries came from America um, the, uh, to, to France, uh, the French had begun an indigenous effort to, to uh, uh, build, build some Baptist churches and, and uh, not, not, not very many um, came to know the Lord, uh, but small groups of, of people would crop up and eventually those might become churches. But uh, the influence of the Baptists under the leadership of uh, Johann Anken in uh, Germany uh, as, he, as his ministry spilled over into Switzerland and Belgium and, and parts of France is really um, a major part of this. But um, uh, much of the, we're looking at France this morning, but much of the uh, interest or the, the building of churches in France really took place in what is today is really Belgium and Switzerland, uh, parts of, little parts of northern France. But, and, and as an example, in the village of Nomain in 1810, a farmer uh, discovered an old Bible, this is an interesting story, and, and a couple of these stories are just some of my favorites, but uh, he discovered an old Bible that, he, that had been hidden in his house for years. Um, he, he read it eagerly and passed it around the village uh, for his neighbors to read. And in 1815, following the Battle of Waterloo, so <laughs> this was actually British territory at that time, this was, this was part of Britain, um, uh, the, um, a British soldier who was a believer, uh, he was assigned to No Maine, and he began to explain the scriptures to, to anyone who was interested. And in time, um, a small meeting house was built, and in 1819, um, a, a Swiss evangelist by the name of Henry Pite uh, very young man, 23 years old. He he came to that area and he addressed that gathering. A year later, he came back. Um, I guess that, that gathering had 123 people by then. He came back a year later in 1820 and held a secret service in a nearby river. And um, he baptized those of that group that had been saved and wished to follow Christ in baptism. And from that, a small Baptist church was was built there in No Maine. Um, in what is now northern France, what was then was uh, Britain. But um, there's another interesting account, and, and you, know, you might wonder, he's, you know, he found this Bible, this, this farmer found this Bible in his, in his home, and that was such an amazing discovery because, of course, this is Catholic region. The Catholics did not allow their people to have Bibles, to own them, to read the Scriptures. So that was why that was such a, uh, a profound thing when he found that Bible. Um, Another account appears in a, a newspaper in 1853, um, another church in France that was begun. This is a fascinating story, but uh, in, um, Napoleon III was emperor at the time, and the, of course the Roman Catholic Church, and specifically the Roman clergy there in the individual uh, towns um, had full control over the people and the government, and uh, that's, uh, this, was, this event was being recorded in the paper um, uh, as a... Uh, as an event that happened, but um, the castle uh, that was in the town was actually the holiday residence of the emperor, and it was just located a few a few miles outside of the city um, in the village of Shelley. And um, in that village, there was a well-to-do family, the Andrew family, A N D R U, and um, a Baptist pastor had made their acquaintance, and soon um, after he witnessed to those folks. Um, and showed them the heirs of Rome and, and, and their ways there. The, uh, they, they received Christ as Savior, this very influential family. And they began to have a small gathering of people at their home every, every Lord's Day. Uh, the attendance grew as people in the village uh, were saved. And of course, that then brought the anger of the local priest. And um, he did all in his power to stop those meetings. Uh, pressure was brought on the only child of, that, of the Andrew family, um, 
and uh, eventually that child was driven from the school um, when the Andrew family went to find reapers for their, for their uh, fall harvest time. Uh, they couldn't find any help because the priest had gone around and threatened uh, anyone who helped them uh, work for that family with excommunication. And um, so he had a real difficult time uh, existing there in that time because of the, the anger of the priests and, and the work there. But um, the, the real opportunity for the priest came when the grandfather, Francois Andrew, passed away. And of course, the grandfather had also been saved. And um, when, when the son went to arrange the funeral, uh, to, to for this, his grandfather to be buried, um, he ran into some problems. And he went to the, he went to the mayor, he went to the different authorities, um, he asked them if a non-Catholic could be buried in the cemetery. They agreed that they would, uh, that, well, they didn't agree to that at first. Actually, he didn't ask them that. He asked them if a non-Catholic could perform the service, and they agreed to that. He forgot to ask them if a non-Catholic could be buried in the cemetery. Uh, that would come up later. And um, so the, the, this was the first non-Catholic funeral in, in the entire region. And of course, it caused great curiosity and four or 500 people came out to, to see what was happening uh, because again, this, this, this event was a non-Catholic uh, funeral. And of course, all those people got to hear the gospel. And that of course, angered the priest even more. But um, so uh, the, uh, the priest um, was not satisfied with what he had done. He, he did stir up. Um, a lot of problems, and he he could not allow to him this non-Catholic to be buried, uh, this heretic to be buried uh, just a few yards from the from the Catholic church door, and so in time he brought pressure on the local magistrates to dig that body up. Now six days had passed, so now we have a decomposing body. He couldn't find anybody to do it, so he he hired a couple of town drunks to to do the task, and and one evening. They went out and um, kind of stumbled around to find the grave. They found the grave. They, they dug the body up, if you can imagine. It was a cold, wet night. And guided by um, their lanterns, they took the body to another area of the town where, uh, where people were buried that had committed suicide, very uh, people that had been disgraced, and, and they buried them over there. And, he bur and they buried that, the uh, grandfather, Francois, uh, they buried his body over there. So I hope you're following this. I know it's kind of a funny story, but so the, the priest was victorious in getting that body dug up because he didn't want that heretic in the, in the uh, Catholic, uh, what he considered the, uh, the, the Catholic cemetery. Well, the deed was done. Um, the corpse was taken over and reburied in the other section. Um, and um, the villagers, though, when they found out the next day, were so outraged that they, they, they took the cane of the priest and the tools of the drunkards and they buried them in the, the, uh, the, the, the first grave that they had dug the body out of and covered them up with dirt so they couldn't find them. But um, the, when the news reached the Andrew family, of course, they were just devastated that this had happened. And um, they went and tried to find redress with the, with the different authorities and they were turned down. Um, the mayor said he had been simply following the, the way laid out by his superior, and the, the priest even arranged for the bishop in the, in the, in the area to come and uh, rededicate the ground that had been defiled by the presence of that body in the, in the cemetery. That would seem to be the end of the story. Very, uh, very difficult time for this, for this Christian family, this Baptist family. But the story goes on, and this was the part that was not reported in the paper, but uh, almost reads like a novel. Several months later, the mayor, um, interestingly enough, was found hanged in his home and accordingly was buried with those having committed suicide. They assumed it was suicide. Um, private, private scandals led uh, the, the man who, who one, of the, one of the government officials that had been uh, in, instrumental in this, uh, in this problem, um, uh, private scandals led him to shoot himself. He was also buried in the, uh, in the, uh, the place uh, for people that committed suicide. And the priest was uh, found and convicted of immorality and was run out of town. And um, really interesting how, how that, uh, this, this all turned around and how these men uh, uh, you know, were found out and he was, he was run out of town in disgrace. And, and, uh, but on the other hand, the services on the Lord's Day were even more, more, um, more successful. In a short time, 11 more people had followed the Lord in baptism. A uh, small revival broke out um, and the cause of Christ greatly flourished in that area. Mr. Andrew's son, uh, by the name of Henry Andrew, um, he, he was called to preach and eventually ordained. And uh, 
uh, history says that this man, Henry Andrew, this is the this is the grandson of the man that was buried and, and dug up, and the and the the son of the of the, the original family that was that was saved. Um, he um, became one of the most well-known uh, pastors in that entire area of Belgium and Switzerland and France, and God greatly used him to build many other churches. And you know, all this came from um, a British soldier who was a believer and in the middle of a wartime, uh, took some time out to, to gather people together, read them the Bible, and explain the passage of Scripture to them uh, if, they, if, they, if they wanted to come in here. And, and, and again, these churches were started. Eventually, the Andrew family was saved, and, and how God works. And uh, really, God works in mysterious ways. And it makes me think that even in very discouraging times, as this Andrew family had to go through, very difficult times, you can imagine initially, um, that... Even when it seems like God is not working, he's always working. And he's always working in people's hearts. And, and uh, just an amazing story of how, how God used in this heavily Catholic area. Everything is, is going against any of these people who, who become believers. And yet God works. And, and just the hundreds and, and the thousands that were saved and churches that were built during this time. So I want to thank the Lord for this, this kind of interesting story um, and um, how, God, how God works. 